Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Talk They Hear You podcast, What Parents Are Saying, Prevention Wisdom, Authenticity, and Empowerment. This podcast is brought to you by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, also known as SAMHSA. Talk They Hear You is a national prevention campaign that aims to help parents and caregivers talk with their kids about the dangers and risks of underage drinking and other drug use. The goal is to provide a platform where parents and caregivers can get informed, be prepared, and take action by having open and honest conversations with their kids about substance use and mental health. We'll feature discussions with parents, caregivers, and nationally recognized experts, all lending their unique perspectives and experiences on how to navigate conversations around these important topics. We will hear what's working, what isn't, and what might be missing in our efforts to help kids stay away from alcohol and other drugs. I'm Debbie Burnt, Director of Parent Movement 2.0, and I'll be your host for this podcast. As a reminder, the views expressed here are not necessarily those of SAMHSA or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. In this episode, we're focused on parenting through the holidays and the many opportunities available during this time to have these conversations. We're honored to welcome three moms. Joby is joining us from Iowa, Teresa from Northern California, and Allie from Connecticut. Thank you all for talking with us today. And if we can start by your telling us a little bit about your families, number of kids, ages, that kind of thing. Allie, if you want to start. Sure. Hi, Debbie. I have two children. We live in Connecticut and they are currently in seventh grade and she's nearly 13. So getting into the teenage years. And then I have a fifth grader who is 10. So I have three grown boys. I have a 27 year old, a 24 year old and a 21 year old. I also have two mini Australian shepherds who round out our family and keep me busy with three uh, grown children. I also have three children, two adult children, 25 and 23, and then an 18-year-old that's still home with us. I should also share, I have three kids as well. I have a 26-year-old, a 22-year-old, and a 17-year-old who's a senior in high school right now. So we just had Thanksgiving, which was Mm -hmm. our first big holiday of this season. We're moving into the Christmas and Hanukkah and Kwanzaa and all of the end of year celebrations. Tell us what the holidays celebrations are like in your home. Are they big gatherings? Are they small? What role does alcohol play in those celebrations? And then we'll talk more about opportunities for conversation and how things progress when your families get together. Allie, you want to start us? For alcohol in my family, It's kind of across the board, but for Thanksgiving this year, I guess it's a good place to start. We celebrated with my in-laws. Alcohol is not a big part. Their tradition, there's wine. No one really makes a big deal of it traditionally, usually. This year was a little different. I have a niece who is in eighth grade and she's very alcohol focused which is fascinating. So she she made a big deal about the wine being there and it brought up a lot of conversation. My own kids, we had to do a lot of processing about that because her parents choose to let her taste it at the holidays. We don't do that. So there was, there was a lot of talk, which is interesting because usually that's not the case in that side of the family that maybe someone has a glass of wine, but that's about it. And so we talked quite a bit about kids and drinking and is it okay to taste is it not in the rules? Because it's different for every family. That's amazing. We were supposed to be covering, are there opportunities to talk about substance use with our kids? That was an amazingly built-in opportunity. You're making me think too that I should just say, this is a conversation not about adults drinking alcohol. If there's alcohol at the holiday celebrations, we're not worried about that necessarily. So we don't want people listening to think, ooh, if there's alcohol there, that's you know bad. But just wanted to get that on the table. Adults and children have two different codes of behavior when it comes to substances for very specific reasons. So we're really focused on under 21. 
that our house food and wine is a really big thing. And it's my husband's a great cook and the Thanksgiving specifically we're cooking all day long. And it's not just my family, it's my entire large family. And so I think the great thing about the holidays is it's it's coming. It's an event that's happening and that the whole family is going to be there. It was an opportunity for a conversation in our house. And what will our plan be going away for a week, staying with family for our still under 21 year old and kind of what I want and what my husband wants and being on the same page and then sharing it with our adult kids who are of age saying, hey, we know that you might feel differently and that maybe our rules are too strict, but these are our rules and this is how we see and we'd like you to support us through Thanksgiving. And it went pretty well, <laughs> pretty well. <laughs> it was great, but it is it is an opportunity for a conversation. And I think that's what is great about, okay, now we've got the next holiday and the next holiday. And and to keep talking, not only with the surrounding family, but with your teenager too, of course, before and after, because sometimes adults behave badly and that's another opportunity for a conversation. So all of my boys are over 21 now, but thinking back to when they were younger and thinking about family celebrations before they were of legal age, it really depended on the side of the family. So when we went to my side of the family, alcohol wasn't a big part of the holidays, a big part of any of our gatherings, but on their dad's side, it was more of a tradition and they they definitely had mm -hmm. more opportunities there to see and be exposed to alcohol. And so it was the need to just have those conversations with them about like, you're going to have different experiences in different settings, right? And so expectations are the same across the board, whether you're at a gathering on your dad's side of the family or on your mom's side of the family, the expectation is no matter what cousins are doing, no matter what you're seeing other people do, these are the expectations. And so they get exposed to different things in different places, but just being really consistent with expectations, regardless of where you are, is something that sometimes it can cause some tension in families because not everyone agrees with your parenting. Uh, sometimes your in-laws don't agree. Sometimes your brothers and sister-in-laws don't agree. So every once in a while, that issue of letting them try it or, hey, come on, it's a holiday. And so just really having those conversations ahead of time with your significant other to make sure that you're going to be a united front when those things come up at the events and the gatherings was something we had to work hard on. I think that you're all bringing up just a perfect segue into having the conversations and how difficult it can be and where the pushback can come from. I think... In some cases, it's not even from the underage kid. It's it's like you're all saying, it's from the people around the underage kid. I'm living the prevention side of it right now because my girls are on the younger side, but I, I do work in prevention. So that's kind of an important caveat. I bring an education level with some training on that front. So talking early and talking often is something we've done quite a bit with both of our girls across the gamut, whether it's alcohol or drugs or other things. But one of the things that really worked prior to Thanksgiving Day was all these conversations about what can actually happen if you start using at a young age about your brain and all of the science that we know. And it was interesting because my oldest daughter, who will be 13, really, like I could see it sinking in. So she said to me when she was watching her cousin drink quite, she had a couple sips of wine. She was very obsessed about a cake that had bourbon in it. It was, yeah. it was intense. Like she's, she's experiencing interest. And my daughter said to me in the car on the way home, do you think anybody has ever told her that if she starts drinking at the age of 13, she's 75% chance of becoming an alcoholic, which like that's statistics that I throw out there, right? Because they're at my, they're at my ready and I get that. But I think that's, you know, knowing the statistics about things and sharing them with the kids, it really, it stuck with her. So she, she clearly, has an association with that. And now she's worried about her cousin. So we had all those talks about everybody has different ways of looking at things and everybody's different family rules and we're going to stick with ours. And this is why, but it can be tricky. Luckily, yeah. mine are pretty well educated. So they didn't test the, how come we can't have it? They were more like, oh my gosh, this isn't yeah. good kind of approach. You're trying to do what's best for your family. I think Teresa made a point on that, but it's also tricky because you can't be the voice at the table. <laughs> like telling everybody else how to do their job. I like the point, Ellie, you made though about the education. And I think that's critical in order mm -hmm. to have those good conversations is to educate yourself first as parents. And so I yeah. know Debbie's got all the resources um, yeah. 
for parents to get educated so that you can have conversations with your kids that have some meat to it, right? I think that that makes a difference. The older they get, they don't kind of want to listen to you anymore. Yeah. So you're like, well, check this out or just look at this. And you just right. got to get little bits here and it's, there. It's not your opinion. It's out there. And, and talking early is so important because if you come too late to the game, right? Like, just like you said, relationship changes with your child as they get older and the younger you can start and the earlier you can talk about it, it almost becomes their way of being, how they see the world. I was thinking just about a holiday where we were at their dad's side of the family. And again, they do celebrate with a lot of alcohol, not just wine, but hard alcohol as well. And sometimes there are relatives who judge you for being what they call too strict or overprotective or so I, I sometimes felt like it was a, a constant battle to try to like hold your ground when you know you had family members who were being somewhat judgmental from my perspective of saying hey don't be so uptight and there was a mindset of like hey if you let them drink here when they're supervised they're gonna be less likely to do it on their own and i disagreed with that so sometimes it felt like honestly just prepping for those conversations and sort of prepping yourself to go in and be consistent and then putting the boy's dad in a bad spot because he's got pressure from his brothers and other folks to lighten up a little bit and to not be so strict on a holiday or do it when they're supervised. But all of those perspectives are, you know, it's, that's their perspective. And for them, for their family, they thought that was going to work. Like letting their kids drink younger, if they were supervised, would keep them from wanting to sneak around and do it. So there was just that very divisive mindset of, our belief system and then other belief systems. That's great. I think one of the, I don't know if it's foundations that this podcast wants to recognize is that parenting is so hard in so many ways. And the number of topics that parents are keeping track of or watching it is just massive in modern time. It's everything from internet gambling and eating disorders and from these very extreme failure to thrive kinds of topics that we're all aware of to lighter weight. They need to have sunscreen on and a hat when they go out the door. I mean, it's just this plethora is massive and alcohol and drugs is one of those topics and it falls up and down in priority for parents all the time. And I think rationally so, because there's so much that we're watching, but we're hoping that we can with this podcast, with the Talk They Hear You material, with just supporting parents, we can help them keep that drug and alcohol conversation a little bit more primary, a little bit more front and center. But it doesn't mean it's going to be easy. And we're going to hit all of those resistances from all kinds of places, the media, family, et cetera. And how do you navigate that? I like this idea of education and getting informed. And we all have these instincts that this is not good or this is not right. And is there anything that backs that up? And I think we all know here that the science very clearly says experimentation when young doesn't work. So I get parents intuitive move towards that because it seems like it would, but because of the way the brain develops and that kind of thing, we know it doesn't work. But then you're the sentinel of one out there pushing this counter-cultural idea. It's just really, really hard. Do any of you have experiences with getting that education or where you came across it? I know, Allie, you work in prevention and Joby, you do a little bit, but talk to us about that. So many communities now are starting to talk about these things a little bit more than before. And so finding out what is, who are the agencies, I don't know if it's your schools or really having these conversations or offering workshops, podcasts, as as we see here, but I love podcasts. I follow a lot of podcasts on different topics that are of interest to me and some of them are parenting related. And so just trying to arm yourself with knowledge in that way. And then I believe strongly as a mom in surrounding myself with friends who share the same, I guess, messages as I do or as my husband and I do. So there's power in numbers. And if you can surround yourself with other moms and dads and other caregivers who share the same views as you or similar, or it can be a little bit safer and a little bit easier and it can make parenting 
just a tad bit easier because you're not shoveling against the tide all the time. And that's something that obviously starts early. That's early prevention type stuff. When you're a parent of a little guy, I would really encourage parents with small children to start thinking about this stuff because you get there before you blink. And if you have your, Debbie, like you were saying, if you have your, your foundation started, it's easier. It's easier to have those conversations and it's easier to navigate the murky waters than it is to be thrown into it in high school and all of a sudden come up and look around and go, oh my gosh, like there's so much and it's scary. I, I think too, the great thing about surrounding yourself in junior high or even younger, starting younger with yeah. other people with same values, same <laughs> wishes to raise their kids um, regarding drugs and alcohol is, is great to start. But what you're going to notice as you go through high school, as that group gets smaller and smaller, because just as the teens have their peer pressure to go with the flow, I have noticed that the parents do too. And it just seems like being popular and having lots of friends and doing what the cool kids are doing, which is a sad, but still a thing happens to the adults too. And so that takes you back to that relationship you have with your kid because we have to even share with them. It's like, okay, well, I know that this family who we felt was on the same page has different attitudes towards it now. So where are we and what do we think and how are we going to deal with this and how are we still going to be friends with these people? How does it work and what does it look like? And it's just, I think my challenge is to not have this conversation every day with my son, <laughs> because if you're just constantly talking about it, which would be my tendency, it's too much. And so I think the opportunity, like Debbie was saying, all the different topics, right? It's just that relationship and the conversations that I think you establish trust with your kids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because the peer group's going to change. Your peer group's going to change. The kids' peer groups are going to change. And so the dialogue has to just, they have to be used to it and they have to trust you. When you kind of go back to your question about where to find educational materials, uh, of course, being in the field of education, I'm always looking at the research, right? And I'm always looking for the organizations who have those evidence-based practices who are sort of well-known. So SAMHSA, in this case, is a place where I would go, right, to try to find information. I would just want to add to the idea of relationship building, talking to your children about expectations, educating them on the dangers of experimenting, the dangers of what can happen, all the negative consequences. I think that's really important. I also think it's important, though, to tell them, listen, like, you might mess up. As much as we're talking about the expectations, I want my kids to know, and I've always wanted my kids to know, if somehow you slip, yeah. please come talk to me. Because at the end of the day, the most important thing is that if they do make a mistake, they get in the wrong crowd, they are somewhere where they can't, you know, have their defenses up, something happens, right? I want to know. I don't want to have this wall up where it's like, you know what? I've always been saying, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And then if they do slip up, now they're like, oops, now I can't say anything to anybody. And now I don't have anybody to have a thought partnership with about how to right the wrong and do it right next time and what we could have done different. So I always wanted my kids to know that while the, these are the expectations, we all make mistakes. And if you do slip up, please come talk to me because I want to help you think through what went wrong? How did that end up happening the way it happened? And what could you do next time? So just want to put that out there back to Teresa's point. That relationship is key. I, I love both that you said that and how you said that. This whole setting expectations and what are our values and all that is so important. But I know so many parents that will shy away from the drugs and alcohol topic because what if they make a mistake? Are they going to call me to pick them up? And, and this idea that we can hold both of those in the same space where here's the expectations. Life's about messing up. We're all making mistakes all the time. You're an adolescent. It almost defines the, the human development phase of adolescence making mistakes. Um, so to be able to put those in the same space, I think is so powerful for this topic, drugs and alcohol, and in general, for just the pressure and the expectations that all of our kids kind of have on them in, in modern life. So that was just really well said. Do any of you have any other experience with that where your kid did mess up? Maybe it was drugs and alcohol, maybe it was something else and they came to you? So I'll share. We did have an experience. We did have a slip up. And I appreciate their honesty. It didn't happen right away, though. 
it happened quickly thereafter, but not not the night of, not even the next morning of. But I felt like because of the conversations that we had had, that our son felt like we were a safe place to have the conversation, right? And to figure out, okay, exactly what Joby said. Okay, well, so how, do, you know, what went wrong? And what can we do to help you navigate that better next time? I, I, I love that we have this age spread um, among all of you from late elementary, middle into high school and college and beyond. I think it just represents that this is a developmental process when it's not, it's not black and white. It's not because I said so. I mean, it is just a constant conversation and being in relationship. And Debbie, just this morning, my thoughts were, it, it changes every week, I feel like sometimes, right? You're having, you're like in one space and you're going along and, and you're feeling like, okay, we're kind of on top of things. And then bam, something yeah. totally changes. And it's like, okay, well, we've got to adjust and, and figure out, I, I don't know, a different type of education. What else do we need to know in order to get us back on the right track again? I love what you were saying about it all circles back to human relationship and authenticity across the span. So whether it's with our kids or other people in our lives, whoever you surround yourself, having that open communication and building those relationships is so critical for all of us, like in our whole lifespan. Yeah. And like Joby was saying, if we, if we can do that and model that and consistently have that open door will be so much better so that when the, the hiccups and the bumps and all, I mean, there's hiccups and bumps all the time when they happen, you've built that trust and love and, and that honesty. I mean, I know when I talk about these things with my kids, I'll always say, like, I think I always start everything with, I'm being honest. Like I'm giving you the honest truth and, and the best of me and the worst of me. And I think that's so critical, Joby, so critical in maintaining that love and trust and connection. So when the bad things happen, because none of us are perfect, our kids aren't and we aren't, the door is there, the, the door is open. I love it. I do too. I don't think I knew when I started parenting, like how much I would be apologizing <laughs> in that process <laughs> and how much fear would be motivating my reactions to things. And I think developing as an individual is part of being in relationship with people. And I wonder if parents feel like they're supposed to have all the answers and a lot of my way or the highway stuff comes out of feeling like I'm supposed to have all the answers. And in fact, as I've continued through this process, I've realized that's kind of fanciful thinking. We're just not. And I love the parenting peer group ideas because you're going to be in relationship and the earlier you can start that and allowing those relationships to help you evolve as a parent as well. You just, you want to get it everywhere you can get it, all of that. I believe wholeheartedly in helping our kids learn about wellness, but what, what about your body and your mind and what you do for yourself and approaching it on the younger ages on that level, because it builds a protective barrier. And it's, I'm thinking of Thanksgiving again, we, a family tradition for us is to run a 5k together, actually a five miler, which was interesting this year. Cause it was my daughter's first five miler. And she was, she's, She's great. She's phenomenal. We had a great run. She won her age group and it was super. But at the end, we got our apple and our banana and then there was champagne and beer. And so, right, like America's decided that drinking is a part of running, which as a runner, it blows my mind. <laughs> what? <laughs> at nine o'clock in the morning. But I think we, we talk to our kids a lot about wellness and they're runners and they move their bodies and they, they really value what goes in because what goes in is how productive you are. All those conversations, which are vitally important. And it was a great learning opportunity for us to sit there and watch little shot glasses of champagne going to everybody with all their little kids wearing turkey hats. And it's a, it's a cultural thing in our country now. And we had good conversation. We had some laughs because it's kind of funny and we giggled about it and we're like, wow. Oh, that's crazy. You just did this whole hard thing and you're sweating and you're, you're healthy and you're vibrant and you're going to drink. <laughs> like, <laughs> but it, it provided an opportunity to learn and grow and we were grateful for it. And we were able to have some good, healthy conversation. But I only say that because the protective factor, at least for my family is very much taking care of your body because they can, they can appreciate that and understand it. I love expanding the conversation in that way. That's that's brilliant. I remember <laughs> we were talking about this before the show and 
and you said you did a 5k or five miler on Thanksgiving. And I was like, Oh, Allie has the younger kids, <laughs> the older, the parents of older kids, myself, I'm too tired to do the 5k at Thanksgiving, <laughs> but I don't, it's, it's a great, it's such a great family tradition opportunity too. Any other wellness type strategies that Teresa, you or Joby have used? Well, I think encouraging your kids to find whatever more tools they have they can use when they're stressed, when they're tired, when they want to celebrate. What are other things you can do besides turning to alcohol? And so we talk about that here. I had two at my two older kids. Well, they're all actually all three are athletes, which is a great thing. And they t when you're dedicated to whatever that sport might be or whatever else your passion is, I think, especially in high school, if you take those things seriously, well, then how does drinking be part of the equation? And so that's something that we talked a lot about here. But then we, I don't know, we do a lot of bubble baths here. It's going to kill me for saying that. <laughs> you know, do you need to go take a, sh a shower and turn the music on really loud? Just other things to do when things are kind of crazy and and you're needing something it's not as much about a wellness strategy as it is about just helping your children build a toolkit of strategies right coping mechanisms ways to handle situations that get sticky or tricky for them so kind of to that point um about just like what do you do for example, if you end up somewhere, like this is one of the big thing with my boys is there's such a difference between how I grew up and how my kids grew up in terms of like, I grew up in small town, Iowa. And to be honest, it wasn't a big thing. Like drinking underage was just not a thing. I had such a different experience. I wasn't exposed to it at every turn. It wasn't on every commercial. It wasn't part of every Thanksgiving run. It, it's just mm -hmm. nowadays, you can't have mm -hmm. a country music video without them talking about drinking in it. So it's everything is about, like you said, alcohol. So I didn't have that experience. So as a parent, I have to sort of get out of my own experience and think about what their experience is. Yeah. And knowing that they are going to be exposed at every turn, almost of everything that they're doing to an option and an opportunity. Right. And so as I started to know and understand that I would make sure that I always knew like where they were going and who they were going to be with. And I was the parent who's like, you're going to so-and-so's house. I want to talk to one of their parents. I know my kids hated me for that. They were embarrassed for that. They're like, please don't call their mom, like to check to see if we're actually going to be home. I said, you know what? That's just the way it is. If you want to go there, I'm calling. And you know what? That did cause some tension between us. But now I always tell them when you're a parent, you'll understand and appreciate it right now. You can't because you're not a parent. So you can't possibly walk in my shoes. Right. Mm -hmm. But I always wanted to have them feel like their out could always be my mom is always checking on me. Like, and their friends knew that their friends knew I was the mom that had called their mom. So if you're inviting my child to a party and no one's going to be there, I guarantee I'm going to find out because I am, so don't, they don't even invite them, right? They're not going to get invited because they know I'm the parent that's going to spoil the party, for example. But one time I did drop my son off and when I was dropping him off, I just felt like something was not right. Like there weren't cars there. I don't know. You know how you just get this feeling as a parent where you're like, something is not right. I drove away and I get down the street. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go back and check in. So I go back and I call him. So he has a cell phone at the time he's you know, in middle school. And he's, I said, Hey, when I drove away, something just did not feel right. And I was like, are you sure that the parents are there and that this is like a really like an upfront, like onboard thing? He's like, mom, he's like, there is nobody. Like there, there aren't any parents here. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you just tell them I called and I need you to come home. We had something that changed in our plans and I need you. I'm not going to be able to, to let you spend the night. So again, I don't know if he was going to call me. I'm not sure what he would have done. But then on the way home, I just said in the future, if ever you get somewhere and They've said, yes, we're going to be home. And here's the thing. That mom told me they were going to be there. Yeah. So I don't know if it changed last minute for them. But again, you just always have to keep your guard up. And so I know this is a little bit of a long story, but arming them with an out. So when you get somewhere and you've done all your homework, I've done my homework as a parent, and it's just not that way. And you end up in a bad situation. What is your out? Mm -hmm. Your out is text me and say, please call me. And I will call you and I will say, I need you to come home. And then that's your out. My mom just calling me to go home. I'm not sure what's going on. So that was our out. Like, just text me if you ever end up in a spot where it changes from what we thought it was going to be. 
Yeah, I'm with That's- you on that, Joby. I mean, my kids are, are are little, but we've armed our middle schooler with exactly that. Like, what what's your out? And also throw me under the bus. Like, throw yeah. me under the bus a billion yeah. times over. I'm <laughs> your mom. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Love yeah. being her. And I, I think that's like, like th- that's empowering to a kid that like, okay, I have a strategy because mm-hmm. gosh, how many of us go into situations and if you don't have a strategy ahead of time, you don't know what to do. Like mm-hmm. as adults, we don't know what to do if we don't have a strategy. So mm-hmm. that's great. And I, I love what you just said about not comparing what your experience is. Cause mm-hmm. I hear that all the time in the prevention world when I was a kid and that's yeah. a slippery slope as a parent to, to constantly when I was a kid, because what these guys are going through is nothing like any of us as a kid because the world is such a different place that like that's such a just a good reminder all the time to know that what they're experiencing is couldn't possibly be what happened so my daughter's 25 and now lives about 15 minutes so not far from home but she's doing her own thing she's working got her friends that she still uses me as an excuse when she needs a break she will still tell her friends you know whatever she'll throw me under the bus which is fine i love that i'm good with that (laughs) just to take a break. I need a break. And my friends have got making big plans and I just want to sit on the couch, mom. So can I just tell them that you need me at home and break and I have to go home. My mom needs me. Totally fine. (laughs) You both mentioned it and I can't, I just want to agree with both of you. I have had my kids use it more than once. It is a great tool for them. I completely agree as well. And those those excuses and those strategies are so great for middle school and early high school. When you get to later high school, that junior, senior year, they will shift. And it's like, they don't want to leave. You know? So what's the conversation then? I have a couple of, of experiences, but i just wondering if you guys had any kind of later high school experiences or how the the code word changed or just anything mm-hmm. on those lines. I was just going to mention that back to the idea of having them involved and in, in making sure your kids are involved in things that are healthy. So we always made them pick some fine arts activity, some sport. It was their choice. You want to bowl, that's fine. You want to run track, you want to do rugby, whatever it is, do whatever you want to do, but you need to be involved in something. And really, as they got up into the upper high school years, it was their coaches that started being a bigger influence on them than as a parent. So if you got caught drinking, you're done for football for quite some time. So again, I started using that like, hey, you put in all this time and energy, you did the two a days, you did the summer camps, you've invested all this time and energy. Are you really going to risk throwing it away? Because you are. I mean, that's that's the chances you're taking. So you shift and see what's the carrot as they get older. Mm-hmm. For my boys, it was the sports and knowing that they'd be suspended and that they were going to be like big consequences if they got caught trying to find the carrot or the lever. All of those are broadening mechanisms for these kids. I mean, we all do it. We get very narrow-minded or focused in the moment. And this idea of taking a party on Friday night and putting it into a broader context, it's one four hour period of your life. Really, this we've got to be hammered and drunk with people that you see every day. So there's a way to, to broaden it. And I think the activities is certainly one mechanism. Well, we were talking about as they get into senior year, especially, yeah. right? We're looking at sending them away um, yeah. to college shortly. So I feel like there are certain things you do when they're freshmen, sophomores, maybe even juniors, but by the time they're seniors, you need to feel comfortable that they can do this. And so then you go back to that relationship you have with that kid and yeah. ask them, what, what is it going to look like? What's, what do you think next year is going to look like for you? And how are you going to do that? And, and helping them figure out what will work and what doesn't work. Right. And, and I think because you do have to start to trust them because they're going to college next year. Yeah. And you, I guess not just trust, but allow them to go out on a Friday night. And I haven't called all the adults. And then, I mean, am I waiting up all Friday night? I am until he gets back to make sure we have a conversation at the end of the night. But you get to that place, too. Right. Right. Because. They're going to leave soon. You're making me think of a couple things. One strategy that I love that a mom shared with me as her child was getting older, where she kind of laid down the law. She's like, look, you are going to need to be able to go to a party and not drink for the rest of your life. This is a life skill that you have got to understand and be able to do. So I'll let you go to the party tonight, not call the parents, all of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But 
I don't want you to drink. I want you to experience what it's like to be there and not be using. And I want to talk to you when you get home and see how it went. And so that was a way she transitioned into that older age group. And, and it worked kind of for quite a bit. That kind of tactic is you involving your child in more in the conversation and and making your request of them relevant in a way that that was really powerful for this particular girl. I mean, she she kind of got it. She was going to go to college and there were going to be parties that she was not going to want to drink at. She was going to have a job at some point in time. And how much cocktail hour is there in, in when you're working? There's a ton of it. You, you can't be wasted every night of the week after you go to cocktail hour if you want to keep that job. Right. So it broadened the conversation and it was a tactic that really worked for her. The other thing we haven't touched on specifically, or it hasn't come up organically, so I want to just put it out there. There's this idea of addiction being being hereditary Mm -hmm. and that kids that drink young are at about a 50% greater chance of becoming alcoholics or addicted to substances themselves versus their non- their peers that don't have family history. And I'm wondering if it's not too personal, do any of you have family history? Have you used that history in your parenting with your kids? And, And what has that how has that gone? What has that been like? Yeah, I can speak to that a little bit. So without giving too much information that's personal for people, sure. but I have a nephew who's currently, he's 19 and struggling with addiction in a big, big way, involving all the bad things that we hear about with kids who have those challenges. But his story is an important part of what I'm you know, doing with my own daughters because they've had a lot of loss with him in their life because he's not around and he doesn't come to things and why. And there's a, there's a lot of big conversations and this goes back to that honesty. I'm super honest with them about it. Sometimes not always to the appreciation of other family members who don't love that. My kids know a lot about it, but to me, it was very important that they know what was happening. They know all of the side effects and it's been a big tool. Um, I'm hopeful every day that he you know, comes around and has a positive outlook in life, but I, I want to be able to thank him and say, you've been influential to my kids because he very much is. They love him very dearly and they're very concerned for him, but they also, they don't want to replicate what he's done. So for them, like they can see the cause and effect, like it's black and white for them. And genetically, is it in their family? No, the very strong addiction side of his family is not genetically related to them, but they they see what addiction does and how, and how it can change a life in high school so drastically, so quickly. It's tough when you say something so negative as a positive, but for us, that's a silver lining because he's been a story for them of someone they love that they've watched. And I think sharing that with your kids is important because you could hide it and you could shame it. Like people tend to do with addiction. There's nothing shameful about it. And we talk openly about mental health and substance abuse disorder and how it happens to the best of the best and good people it happens to all the time and one of our goals as parents is to help it not happen to them thank you for sharing that appreciate it yeah and i was going to share as well just that substance use disorder runs in both sides of my children's family so on their dad's side on my side and so I've definitely used that as far as an educational tool to talk about just the the idea that experimentation for you is so much more dangerous than potentially maybe your friends who don't have that run in their family because maybe they're going to experiment and one day they're like, I've had enough and I walk away from it. Mm-hmm. But you do the same exact thing and you can't walk away because you have a predisposition. You have a potentially genetic connection to it that's not going to just let you put it down one day and be like, yeah, that was fun, but I'm done. You know, I'm just I'm done with it now. So I always talk to them just about the fact that I don't, I don't want you to roll the Russian roulette here and see like, how does it work out for you? Because it may not work out in your favor. You're never quite sure um, what you might be taking. So, you mm-hmm. know, you hear stories of terrible, tragic, tragic stories. And so it just... Don't yeah. even go there. Just let's right. not even go there because of you're, the Russian roulette. Mm-hmm. Well, and, it, and you're you're exactly right with fentanyl in the street drug scene right now. I mean, street drugs have just become. I, I can't even wrap my head around the number of stories of mm-hmm. some kid ordering a you know, Ativan off of Snapchat mm-hmm. and it shows up and he dies. I mean, right. it's just yeah. <laughs> 
it's just beyond comprehension. Yeah, I, I think that's really powerful that you've armed your families with that. We, I, I have the same situation in my family. It's one of the reasons why I stay in prevention work. And and my kids were really receptive to this message, especially early on. We had some family members that were you know, actively using that have passed away now, but they kind of watched that as well. And we felt like, I mean, the hiding it just becomes deceitful. So it was, we've, we found a way to kind of let them see what was happening without have them having to be so exposed to the really salacious details. But that seemed to really be, you know, powerful for them. Even still though, when they got to that 11th and 12th grade year, where all of that independence and pulling away and separating from mom and dad starts to happen, they would get really frustrated by that. And as a parent, I had to, there were moments where I just was like, oh my God, just have a drink and let's get over, get it over with. Cause it's just such a fight, but I had to really parent through that and stand with my convictions about them not using. And it was uncomfortable, you know, and it was, you know, and it was loud and it was screaming and it was crying and it was everything. So it's this idea that we're going to be able to find a easy, gentle path around drugs and alcohol with our kids. I always admire those kids, those parents that can do it, but most of us are not going to, and it's going to be hard. So I love all the personal stories. I love the pushback that you get from the culture, everyone around us, the parents, and the idea that some of your great parenting peers in middle school are going to completely shift on you and become the parents that are hosting all the parties. And you're like, wow, we were so against that just two years ago, and now you're the parent that hosts all the parties. How did that happen? Is there any way that you have navigated the party scene or helped your kid navigate the party scene? Any specific conversations you've ever made to parents or calls you've made to parents that resulted in specific conversations? So I'll start just saying, obviously my kids are, all of them are older and they've been through this. And so when they were in high school, we were not a family that hosted the parties, but I told my boys, if you have friends who have been drinking bring them to our house and have them stay there because I don't want to see anything bad happen to them if they're scared to go home because they're scared of the consequences. So I had a lot of kids that ended up in my basement. I would go upstairs and like bodies everywhere. Like who's all here? I don't know who's here in the morning. I'm just going to get donuts. But the rule was if they ended up at our house, like I was going to talk to them in the morning and we were going to, again, if they ended up there, they had to sort of exit ticket was a conversation with me. And I'm talking to them about, again, you need to talk to your parents about this. Like, I don't want to have to be the one to tell them you need to be the one to tell them, but I just want them to be safe. And I actually picked up kids. Like they would call me. And so sometimes it's just, they don't feel comfortable for whatever reason. They're scared to tell their parents. They're not sure what the repercussions are going to be. I don't know what's going on with them and their parents at home, but sometimes another adult is the safe person. So I always wanted to be that, not just for my own kids. I wanted to be that for their friends. So again, kids are going to mess up. If you go into this thinking as a parent, I know that I'm having the right conversation with my kids. And I know that. But what happens when the influence is too great and they end up in a spot where they just don't, they can't use the resources they have at their disposal and they end up in a bad spot. I wanted all their friends also to know. And I think my kids really respect me for that because they knew, they know I picked up some of their friends and brought them home when they couldn't call their own parents. But it was really about safety. So again, sometimes just the conversations when you say talk, they hear you. You're talking about prevention. But then you're talking about also, what do you do to, to try to help kids be safe? And if you can't prevent it, what do you do to mitigate it once it's happening? That's brave. I don't know if I'm that brave of a parent. <laughs> That's just to, to be that that safety spot. It takes a lot of courage and that's just really impressive. So, any well, other I don't know if it was the right thing to do. I'm just saying it was something I did. So I could be sharing that and someone out there is listening and saying, that's absolutely the dumbest thing you could have possibly done. And it be. I don't know. You know, I don't know. Just do what you think you, you should do in the moment. That's all you can do as a parent. You just try to do the best you can. So well said. That was really great. I don't think anyone's thinking that was the dumbest thing they ever heard though. <laughs> so let's switch back to the holidays real quick. Other stories about the holidays, opportunities that you've seen, any moments when you were able to have a conversation, anything else that you would share with us to 
I'm put a bow on that. I feel like we've hit it to be able to set the expectations, have that relationship of trust going both ways and plans, have a plan. So we're heading into Christmas. Well, we've got two more weeks of school, but then Christmas break and then that New Year's Eve. Like, what does that look like when you're 18 years old? <laughs> yeah. So it's just um, the plan and what does it look like and what are you going to do if it goes wrong? I mean, things we've already all talked about. From a younger child perspective, I think one of the things I always talk about is how can celebrations be amazing and traditional and wonderful without alcohol at the center? That's, again, talking early and Mm -hmm. coming up with those plans as a family. What are we going to do differently? And like Joby said, it's all going to change as as kids get to high school. But if you can set your foundation and and enroll with it every year and change your approach. But we, we try to talk about Celebration, you know, for our family is not necessarily alcohol and food based even in our family. Like what are the other things that make it special? And really don't assume kids know. I think sometimes we assume they know and they don't really know until we tag it and give them the tool. That's a great insight. It's hard to remember that their brains are still very much in development. And depending on their personalities, they present really big. They present like they've got it together. They don't need your help. But you know what? they do. Well, that was fantastic. Thank you all so much, Teresa, Joby, and Allie for joining us today and sharing your amazing insights and experiences. We touched on a lot of topics. Many of them are encompassed in the talk they hear use five conversational goals, which can be found on the Talk They Hear You website, along with all of the Talk They Hear You materials. That website is Talk They Hear You, all spelled out, dot SAMHSA, S-A-M-H-S-A dot gov. You'll find information on this podcast as well at the website homepage. Please share it with your friends. The more we can be in conversation with each other, the better for everyone, especially our kids. And to that end, we'd like to hear from you. Would you like to be on our show? Do you have stories to share, tips or techniques that have worked or not worked for you as a parent? Or do you have questions for us? If so, please contact us at what parents are saying at gmail.com. So all spelled out, what parents are saying at gmail.com. And like any podcast, we're also always trying to improve. So if you would like to send us feedback on anything else, we know that your input will help us design the most useful interviews possible. Thank you all for joining us and we'll see you next time. Bye.